Hey everybody, it's Adam Farkas. Welcome to another OD Wire webinar. Thanks for coming out tonight. So just diving into the topic tonight, it's all about uh, vernal keratoconjunctivitis or VKC. Uh, and as you, you probably know, uh, it's a severe form of allergic inflammation that affects the ocular surface. It's relatively uncommon, but it can be vision threatening when it occurs. So that's why it's critical that everyone remains vigilant and on the lookout for it. Um, and so that's why tonight's talk is so important. And fortunately for us, we have two experts on the subject tonight who are going to tackle this with us. So Dr. Susan Resnick is the president and managing partner of Drs. Farkas, Castle, Resnick & Associates, uh, contact lens and anterior segment specialty practice in New York. Uh, and I think if you've ever watched an ODWire webinar or attended CEWire, you've heard Dr. Resnick speak. So you're in for a real treat tonight if you've never heard her before. And also with us tonight is Dr. Susan Gramacki, who's the director of con the contact lens service at First Sight Vision Care in Fulton, Maryland, which is sort of right in between uh, Baltimore and DC. Dr. Gramacki is a well-known author and editor. She's published hundreds of articles uh, over the past 30 years. So she has decades of experience uh, treating anterior segment disease and also with contact lenses. So I, I can't think of two better people to speak to us about VKC tonight. And uh, Dr. Resnick is gonna kick things off describing sort of the background of the disease, the epidemiology, pathophysiology, uh, as well as some of the challenges of diagnosing and treating VKC. And then Dr. Gramack is gonna talk about a novel treatment option for VKC. And then at the very end, what we're gonna do is take all your questions uh, and have a little back and forth with both of the speakers. So guys, take it away. Adam, thank you so much for having us. I wanna Thanks, Santin, as well. It's such a pleasure to be a part of this. It's, you know, when it comes to something like VKC, uh, it affects uh, all of us in a certain way, even though the disease is very, very rare. So I'm going to start with, um, you know, we probably all learned about this in school, but because it's rare, we might not see it very much. And what's most important, though, is the research that's gone on in the last few years. So this is not going to just serve to refresh our memories, but to bring us all up to date on this. And I think once we are, we're going to realize that we probably are underdiagnosing it and under-recognizing it. So what is VKC? Well, it's a severe form of allergic conjunctivitis that we've been taught and we understand occurs predominantly in male children. But we're going to find out in a moment that adults are affected too. Um, as with most allergic entities, it has both a seasonal and perennial variant. And the perennial one is seen more in countries uh, with hot climates, and of course the seasonal one will occur in the temperate climates when the weather gets warmer. So we obviously know that there is a climate or environmental component. Um, what's most critical about VKC is that it can be site-threatening uh, in terms of its complications. And so obviously this is the kind of thing we want to recognize as early as possible. So as I just mentioned, adult VKC is now becoming more apparent to us. It was as recent as 2013 that it was described in the literature. A little bit different than the uh, juvenile form in that we actually have two variants. So we can see one where it's the juvenile form that will persist beyond puberty with recurrences. And then you can also have one form that actually starts in, ad in adulthood and arises de novo after puberty, which kind of goes against a little bit of what we were taught in that it was originally thought that VKC actually would kind of phase out after puberty. So it was always thought that there may be some hormonal components, which there probably are, but that's not um, the sole aspect. And we're gonna see as we go into it more and more how multifactorial this disease is. The adult form resembles the childhood components, um, but the corneal involvement is more minor, but what is more major and more concerning is the surrounding inflammatory effects are much more severe. So we'll see more limbal stem cell deficiency, keratoconus, um, obviously we have to think about eye rubbing in these patients, um, traditional treatments using steroids, uh, inducing cataracts and glaucoma. So again, the adult variant is more involved um, I don't want to say more serious, but it extends more into the surrounding tissues, while the cornea may not be as involved. So how rare is VKC? Well, it's only about a tenth of a percent or 
0.5% of patients with all ocular diseases. And the key demographics show that the prevalence is roughly 100 times greater in Africa than other northern countries. And it's more prevalent in warmer, windy climates, and that would be like the Mediterranean, Central Africa, South America. But we do see it here in North America, China, Australia, and Europe. The president, the Prevalence here in the United States for children less than 18 years of age, age is just a little over one in 10,000. We know that it's more common in younger children. A particular study in Italy showed a 16 times greater prevalence in children under 16. And again, perhaps most importantly, the regional differences in prevalence are thought to be due to genetics, environment, and the genetic and environmental interaction. So looking now at adult VKC, again, the data is more recent and it's more variable and not as robust, but we have a 2017 study or a model that shows an estimated prevalence here in the US of almost 16%. But then you look at India and Italy and they're, look, um, they're actually showing uh, in a small study a little less than 3%. And then you look at Africa and we see 56% of overall VKC patients had adult VKC. So again, it's very variable with a lot of questions and um, to be answered and gaps to be filled in in terms of research. So the pathogenesis is what I find the most interesting. Um, you know, we think about it as an allergy, but it's not the traditional allergy that we've all been trained on, uh, you know, looking at IgE mediated responses. Um, this is not purely a type one a hypersensitivity, if you remember the type 1 being humoral, uh, being B cell mediated with preformed uh, mediators such as histamine, cytokines, and lipids. We now know that there's a strong Th2 lymphocytic effect, and there is also uh, so, some Th1. So this is a type 4, if you'll remember that, as a delayed hypersensitivity, where you're going to get eosinophils bringing in different interleukins and um, stirring up the cytokines, you know, more of these uh, chemokines, lipid mediators. So it is, you know, much more involved than we originally kind of knew. And uh, one of the researchers, Bonini, actually found that in 50% of patients with VKC, they could not even um, find evidence of IgE. It was purely eosinophilic, which suggests that it is Th2 lymphocyte, lymphocyte driven. So we think more about these more, much more severe, involved, long-term, non-remitting kinds of inflammatory responses causing vasodilation, uh, inflammation, mucus secretion, tissue degradation, vascular permeability, all the things that make these poor kids and adults miserable. Uh, you may, may remember that we learned in school about, you know, morning symptoms being the worst. Uh, morning misery, it was called. And so let's take a look at this now. We can actually break it down into, you know, an immediate response, which would conjure up those images of seasonal allergic or your standard, what I call non-severe, non-visually threatening allergies, which might occur in hours, uh, and those might repeat. But when we look at VKC, we have reappearance of initial symptoms which would be the itching, the redness, the swelling, the edema uh, occurring days to months later. But what happens? What happens is we have disruption of the ocular surface. And that's what characterizes or distinguishes VKC and makes it so much more concerning than standard, you know, hay fever, rose fever, the kinds of things um, we think about in, you know, regular mast cell stabilizing controlled allergies. We have disruption of the ocular surface and severe inflammation, which may have visual consequences. So, um, you know, that's what um, characterizes the differences. So when we think about the pathophysiology, while it's an isolated entity in most patients and greater than 50%, we actually see comorbid allergic conditions in over 40%, which was shown in one Italian study. And you can see here, VKC alone was close to 60%. VKC with other atopic diseases was about 42%. What I find interesting, 
or maybe not so surprising, is that it's more prevalent as comorbidities with asthma and rhinitis. And the way I think about it is the lungs and the nose are mucous membrane tissues, as are the eyes. So to me, the connection is there. When it comes to eczema, skin, and urticaria, uh, you know, the, the anatomy, the molecular or cellular physiology of those tissues are different. So it doesn't surprise me that asthma and rhinitis would be more comorbid with VKC than some of the skin-related entities. So there were two basic kinds of appearances of VKC, and they are not mutually exclusive. You can have both of them in the same eye, in the same patient. The palpebral, as you might expect, has to do with the tarsal plate. And you will see, as you see here on the left, there'll be marked cobblestone papilla. And this is different from, you know, even your grade three GP GPC that we were seeing in the old days with certain kinds of contact lenses. I mean, you know, these papilla come out and shake their hands when the patient, you know, shakes your hand when the patient walks in the room. You can't mistake them. Uh, similarly, if you see the limbal variant, it is rather concerning and not difficult to miss, um, or not easy to miss, I should say. And you'll see this gelatinous ring, uh, very different from uh, adult arcosinillus. It's raised, uh, it's gelatinous, and it affects the limbus. You will also see Horner's Tranta's dots, which are these diffuse um, and they can be intermittent white or yellowish little tiny dots. They will disappear or reappear. And those are actually collections of uh, epithelial cell debris and degraded eosinophils. So these are essentially the two entities that are pathognomonic of GPC, of G I'm sorry, of VKC, which is what makes it different from some of the other allergic conditions. So you can start to see these corneal changes. Later on, you may see corneal vascularization, epithelial microerosions, and I just mentioned the horner trantas dots and, and the papillae. Um, the symptoms are typically bilateral. They're rarely unilateral. The hyperemia is marked. Um, and again, the symptoms can start like a mild, mild seasonal, uh, allergic conjunctivitis, but it escalates very quickly. So, you know, it's very important on all allergy patients. If I have to, if you leave with one thing tonight, it's flip those lids. I mean, three simple words, um, because those papilla will be the thing that kind of makes you scratch your head and say, okay, what really am I dealing with here? So the potential complications are the ones that we obviously worry about the most, but if we learn, and we're gonna talk about how to control the disease and control patient behaviors early on. So, you know, we wanna try not to see the keratitis. The shield ulcers are, again, another entity that's pathognomonic, and that has to do with those large cobblestone papilla being on the underside of the lid, scraping against that cornea. You may see plaque, you might get a permanent reduction in visual acuity. We're actually gonna be talking tonight about how to prevent that. Um, you know, microbial, microbial keratitis is probably a little rare, but again, in young children, a child that may develop it at three, four years old, um, you know, you can also worry about some, some amblyopia setting in. So again, it's important to diagnose it early and treat it early. So this was, these statistics were based on an interesting study. It was a prospective observational case series. And they had a questionnaire completed by 30 children, um, again, males predominating because it does affect males to a greater degree with active VKC. And um, it looked at well, what impact does it have on daily life? And when I think about a rare disease, as much as you know, I'm empathetic, obviously, to all patients, when it comes to children, it tugs at the clinical heartstrings a little bit more. When you think about what's happening to these kids, so we just talked about the fact that this disease is more prevalent in the warmer, harder climates. So what do these kids want to do? They want to go to the pool. They want to play sports. You know, these it's affecting all the things that they would do, you know, seasonally or perennially in the warmer months. And so, you know, when something affects your child, it affects the parent probably 10 times greater. 
And um, so these are the things that we really want to prevent or control as much as we can. And the study also showed that when you look at quality of life outcomes, uh, there was a greater reduction in quality of life in children with these more severe, um, I'll use the word inflammatory slash allergic conditions such as VKC and AKC. So, you know, when we look, look at um, impact on daily life, you know, it's numerous. So even, um, you know, talking about getting these kids to school, they wake up in the morning and they're miserable. Um, you know, then they get to school and let's say they have to go to the school nurse a number of times a day. They're missing classes. They're missing, you know, enjoyment with their friends. Many of them can't go outside for recess. Um, you know, they come home and obviously the parents worry even more. So, you know, when it comes to being a parent or knowing a parent with a child, the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, did I miss something? Should I have gotten my kid diagnosed earlier? And the answer is, well, yeah, and that's our job. Um, you know, they, they blame themselves first. We know it's not their fault. Um, it is a hard disease to diagnose. It may come, it may start out slowly and, you know, smolder a bit before it kind of escalates. Um, we have the you know, we, we hope we're not going to give incongruous care. That's why we're speaking tonight. And, you know, the information vacuum, you know, I think we're getting there. Uh, certainly we're learning more. And I think having uh, a new treatment option, which Dr. Gramacki is going to go over in a few minutes, is certainly going to allow us to take this, you know, and put it on the radar. So to summarize, VKC is a severe form of Ig. E and Th2 cell mediated allergic conjunctivitis that occurs predominantly in male children less than 10 years of age. It does occur year round, you know, particularly in the tropics. The symptoms are everything that the eye, however the eye can respond in a negative sense, it will. Um, erythema, hyperemia, mucus discharge, tearing. I mean, if you've ever had a bad allergic day just being out on the golf course, you know, multiply that 100 times. That's what these kids and adults go through. The complications can be severe. I worry most about keratoconus because of the eye rubbing. Uh, I worry most about corneal scarring. And it can have a negative impact on quality of life, just on the family dynamics and on social and educational outcomes. So we talked about the importance of us not being the weak link in diagnosing and treating these children. So how can we overcome that? Well, the first part is to understand again how different VKC is from the other allergic entities. And what you'll see here, unfortunately, is that there is a huge overlap in signs and symptoms. So we have on the left seasonal allergic followed by perennial, and then we have our vernal and our atopic. And we have um, giant papillary conjunctivitis at the end and contact blepharoconjunctivitis right there in the middle. And you can see how the biggest overlap is with VKC and AKC. As a matter of fact, there's very little difference um, between the two when you think about it, other than VKC um, is obviously much more prevalent in the children. So the adults will be a little harder to, to diagnose. I think the one distinction there would be. Um, you know, probably there's more of a prevalence of eczema along with e of AKC. You will see more skin reactions. But note that all of these are atopic except for the, um, the contact sensitivity. Remember that atopy, by the way, means that you have tissue responses in other parts of the body that are not directly in contact with the allergen. So it makes sense that a contact induced allergy would not be atopy. That's just a little refresher from our school days. So let's look closer now at the VKC, AKC difference because, um, you know, they are very, very similar. Um, so we know that the Horner Trantis dots are much more common in VKC. Um, if we were to have a patient go through eosinophilic scraping, uh, it would be more prevalent in VKC. There's certainly more of a male predominance in VKC, and there's an age difference. Um, there's a higher incidence, however, as we mentioned, of scarring in adults. Um, 
and in AKC, that being more prevalent in adults. So there are very, very few distinctions, but if you keep those key things in mind, VKC younger, VKC boys, um, you will be more likely to make the early diagnosis. So when we look at diseases, you know, the first thing we always do is we kind of always like take a stepladder approach and we look at what are the modifiable factors. And, you know, that's the first thing we want to look at. What's easy to do to relieve um, the patient of symptoms early on? Let's, we want to look at the environment. We want to look at basic personal pr um, practices. So, you know, obviously you want to avoid the, the triggering factors. Um, and it's really important once you make the diagnosis to educate the patients and caregivers early um, and to really tell them what to expect. Because, you know, I always like to tell them, you know, without scaring patients, you want to tell them that it's not unexpected for things to get worse, for the kid to feel miserable. You know, tell them, tell it like it is, because knowing as a patient is is really being prepared and it's so much easier mentally and emotionally to deal with illness when you know that okay this is the disease i'm you know here's what i need to do so you know keep them out of the dust keep them away from pets if they have allergies there washing hair before bed using sunglasses and certainly cold compresses preservative free tears um by the way putting the preservative free tears in the refrigerator has a great uh, effect because you can reduce the hyperemia, constrict the vessels so that some of those preformed mediators are less likely to, um, to spill out. The other thing is keep um, your patients from rubbing. When you rub, you actually break the cell membranes of the mast cells. So it's important to explain that to patients so they understand why we're making the recommendation. So the management challenges have been interesting, and that's you know, you know, obviously it says here that there's many therapeutic options. Well, there are many, but there are also few. I mean, um, the many may include these home-based measures that we talked about, but really, what have we had? You know, the first-line treatments are only palliative. They're effective in mild cases. And really, we had to go, you know, right to the big guns, which are steroids. And we all know the problems and long-term consequences of steroids. And again, when you're talking about a 10-year-old, you know, you want to try to avoid steroids if you can. Look, you have to use them to prevent or to control that horrible cascade. Um, diagnose it early, get them on it, keep them on it, you know, taper it down. But having an alternative measure is really the key. So let's just sum this all up in terms of practice pearls for management. Patient and parent awareness of the disease's long duration. You know, you got to let them know this isn't the flu. Um, it's going to be there. It may fizzle out when they hit puberty, but get it under control, and we have a better chance of keeping everybody happy. Um, there are going to be things that they have to do. It's not just putting drops in their eyes. Um, you're going to get them in early. Um, schedule them, you know, way before wherever, whatever country you live in or whatever part of North America you may live in, you know when um, the temperatures change and the humidity goes down. Um, and then it's really all about effective prevention and control you know, of inflammation. Um, Sue, I'm gonna just uh, bring you in here because I know you're gonna do the next section, but uh, what do you do to diagnose it early? What's, you know, how do you zoom in? Well, Susan, first of all, I want to say it's always a pleasure seeing you every year at the Academy at the CCLRT events. And so it's a special treat to actually see you in the summertime as well, and especially lecturing with you. So I can't wait to get going and to, uh, shall we say, share the podium here and talk about VKC. Uh, as far as your question, you mentioned it. You hit the nail on the head evert the lids every single time, every single patient, especially in a patient complaining about itching, and especially that fits the profile that you uh, so eloquently laid out, age, symptoms, mucus discharge, you name it, male, children, you know, but not just that profile. We can talk later about a patient that I saw this spring 
a young woman, 22 years old, who I am convinced has VKC. And we can talk about that if we have a little bit of time in the end. But let's talk about how to treat it. Cyclosporin A has been studied as a treatment for VKC for a long time, since the 1980s. But the reason we're calling it novel is twofold. One is that different concentrations, as you can see, were studied over the years. And some are too weak and some are too strong, leading to tolerability issues. 0.1% here is really the sweet spot. And if you open up your Will's eye manual, which we're all doing in clinic, right? <laughs> if we want to check something, we open the Will's. I looked at it, and as recently as the year 2000, cyclosporin was not even listed in the Will's Eye Manual as a treatment for VKC, likely because, number one, it wasn't in this concentration, and it was not in the form that we're going to be talking about today, and of course, number two, it hadn't been FDA approved yet for this indication until now, and the reason is that by changing the vehicle, for example, a cationic preservative-free artificial tear, the medication becomes safer and more readily tolerated and can be used effectively in a concentration as low as 0.1%. So let's talk about the emulsion and what makes it special. Santin developed 0.1% cyclosporin ophthalmic emulsion in order to increase the bioavailability of cyclosporin A at the ocular surface. Cyclosporin CE, cationic emulsion, 0.1% is a calcineuronin inhibitor, immunosuppressant, approved for topical ophthalmic use. In the US, cyclosporin 0.1% is approved for the treatment of VKC in children and adults. Let's look on the right here. The CSA is lipophilic. So we coat it here with a surfactant, and then on the outside is a cationic agent. So by making it a cationic emulsion, there is now attraction to the negatively charged cell membranes here, increasing residence time at the ocular surface. So if we look at, for example, unpolarized eye drops, they will simply wash out. Middle picture would be an anionic emulsion. If that is used negative to negative, we're gonna get some electrostatic repulsion. The cationic emulsion is the key, as you can see, because the positive charge will do very nicely with a negative charge of cell membranes. So what are the benefits then? You get rapid spread across the cornea. The contact surface is maximized. It stays longer on the cornea versus unpolarized eye drops. And as a result, CSA, CE, has increased ocular bioavailability compared to anionic CSA nanoemulsions. The CSA, CE clinical development program included the supportive phase 2-3 Nov Novative study with 118 patients, and the longer pivotal phase 3 Vectus study with 169 patients. I'm going to talk about the Vectus study in great detail. It was really well planned out. There are basically three groups that the patients were randomly placed into. One was 0.1% QID four times a day. The second group was 0.1% BID plus the vehicle twice a day. And lastly is just the vehicle itself, which is a pretty good vehicle, as I mentioned, QID. And then what it looked at, the primary endpoint, was a mean composite score that encompassed CFS score. And down below you'll see CFS is an abbreviation for corneal fluorescein staining, corneal ulceration, in steroid rescue medication use over four months. So if a patient was suffering so much that they had to grab a steroid to try and help out with the comfort, that is what we're referring to with rescue medication. 
So the VECTIS study, there were 169 patients, was a multi-center, randomized, double-masked, vehicle-controlled, parallel arm phase three study that assessed the efficacy and safety of two cyclosporin A dosing regimens in pediatric patients with active severe VKC with severe keratitis. Years ago, when I was a first year optometry student, I love talking about this because I was the only research assistant for the CLEC study. I was the only employee of the CLEC study. And as a young student, I learned so much from the principal investigators, Joe Barr, Carlos Zadnick, Tim Edrington, and I learned about inclusion in studies. And it's very interesting because it's, it's important to assure that the patients in the study actually have the diagnosis that you're studying. And as part of the CLEC study, for example, patients had to have a slit lamp sign of keratoconus. They had to have a Fleischer ring, vote stria, or a scar. In this case, the patients had to have severe keratitis. And I know Dr. Resnick showed a slide that keratitis is not necessarily present in all patients with VKC, but it's very important for the purpose of a study to make sure the patients have VKC. And one way to do it is to make sure that they have VKC and severe keratitis. And this ended up being an important marker that we were studying as well. Back to the VECTA study. The first patient was enrolled in 2013 and the study was completed in 2016. The duration of the study, as you can see, was 12 months and it was divided into two parts. One was a four month efficacy evaluation treatment period. And then next was an eight month safety follow-up period. The primary endpoint of Vectus was a composite efficacy score based on one, keratitis assessed by the modified Oxford scale that goes from zero to five, two, the need for rescue medication, which was a corticosteroid, and three, the occurrence of corneal ulceration. Secondary endpoints, meanwhile, included assessment of four main VKC symptoms, photophobia, tearing, itching, and mucus discharge. These were subjectively assessed by patients utilizing something called a visual analog scale, where a patient basically has a 100 millimeter strip and they physically mark on that strip from zero to 100 how severe are their symptoms, photophobia, tearing, itching, mucus discharge. So that is called a VAS. Also, a CFS was included, which is the corneal fluorescein staining. Also, use of rescue therapy at months one to four. Also, CFS responder rate at month four. That's a good thing, a responder. I'll define it in just a little bit in one of the next slides. They also looked at a quality of life assessment and lastly, slit lamp assessment. This slide shows the results for the two active treatment groups versus the vehicle in the four month randomized period. The difference in the least squares mean versus vehicle was 0.76, as you can see here, for the QID group and 0.67 for the BID group. Both differences were statistically significant, confirming superiority of the active treatment over the vehicle. Now the treatment was the only factor with a significant effect on the comparison, P equals 0.006. Baseline CFS score and exposure to VKC season did not have a significant effect. P was greater than 0.05. To summarize the secondary endpoints for months one to four, the benefit of the CSAC treatment were also evident on most secondary endpoints, particularly in the high dose QID treatment group. So for example, improvements in four main VKC symptoms, photophobia, tearing, itching, and mucus discharge were observed in all treatment groups with the greatest improvement seen in the, quarter, the CSA CE QID group. The CSA CE QID treatment was associated with significantly greater symptom improvement versus the vehicle at months one, 
two and four for photophobia, at months two and three, or I'm sorry, two and four for tearing, and at all monthly time points for itching and mucus discharge. Next, the quality of life improved in all treatment groups. Improvements were significantly higher in the CSA, CE, QID group versus the vehicle at most time points. And lastly, there was less use of rescue medication in patients treated with cyclosporin than those treated with vehicle. The CSA, CE, QID was 32%, the BID, 31.5%, and the vehicle was 53.4. The mean number of rescue courses is depicted in the figure on the left. There was a much greater use of rescue medication, corticosteroid, among patients in the vehicle group compared to the cyclosporin groups. The percentage of patients with at least one use of rescue medication over the treatment period was pretty comparable, as you can see, in the QID and BID groups. Both rates were lower compared to the vehicle group. This slide shows the logistic regression analysis for CFS responders. So to define what a CFS responder is, per definition, they are patients with a CFS score at month four less than or equal to 50% of the baseline CFS. And those who did not withdraw from the study for a reason possibly due to treatment. And three, they were free from occurrence of ulceration and use of rescue medication in the last three months of treatment. So as you can see, the highest response rate was actually found in the CSA CE BID group was 61.1%, followed by the QID group, 57.1%. The response rate in the vehicle group was 34.5%. The comparisons of both cyclosporin dosage groups versus vehicle showed statistically significant differences favoring active treatment, P less than 0.05 for both comparisons. Data for the responder rates were later reanalyzed. This is actually not shown on this slide. The original analysis that you see on this slide actually took into account months two, three, and four. The reanalysis included month one. And in this reanalysis, the responder rates were actually 31 out of 56, 55.4% for the QID, and a little bit less, as I might expect for the BID, so 50% for the BID and 27.6% for the vehicle. Safety assessments revealed that the incidence of treatment emergent adverse events, or TEAE, were similar across treatment groups. And the majority, as you can see, were mild or moderate in severity. The only exception was installation site pain, which occurred at a higher rate, as you might expect, in the high-dose group. The most common treatment-related events were installation site pain, puritis or itching, and erythema. Laboratory data, vital signs, and other safety-related observations, including slit lamp exam, best corrected distance acuity, and IOP, raised no additional concerns. Now let's talk about the US FDA specific analyses. Regarding keratitis scores, all three treatment groups started, as you can see, with an almost identical amount of keratitis, just over four on a five point scale. After four months, the vehicle had reduced the, the staining score, just the vehicle itself on average, by about 1.2 points. The BID administration, far right over here, decreased it by about 1.9, and as expected, the QID decreased it by 2.3. So on the right, you can see that there is a 95% confidence interval in the QID dosage reducing keratitis more than the vehicle. 
The same goes for itching. The QID dosage reduces the patient's subjective itching score of about 78 out of 100 initially by about 44 points. The BID dosage by about 35 and the vehicle by about 25. And lastly, there were a few reported adverse reactions to note, but also note that these are consistent with the known safety profile of any topically applied cyclosporin A. And with that, I would like to open up the floor for questions. Well, thank you, Susan, and thank you, Susan. <laughs> um, let us, why don't we turn on our cameras here too so people can see us so we can prove that we're real human beings. Um, try to flip those on here. So howdy, everybody. Um, so let me uh, pull up the questions here. So again, if anybody wants to answer a question, uh, ask a question, feel free right on the screen on the right side, there's a box where you can ask questions. Uh, feel free to uh, put a question in there and we will try to answer them. So you can give that a shot. And first question here, and, and again, uh, you know, Susan and Susan, if you, you guys want to jump in, um, after we ask it. Um, so Dr. Resnick mentioned in the beginning um, that cobblestoning, right, the papillae that, that were just gigantic, uh, almost were pathognomonic for the disease. Question here is, do you tend to see that later in the disease progression or can that come right from the very beginning? I, I'll answer that while she's unmuting herself. I tend to see it at the beginning because I've seen it and you know, Dr. Resnick hit the nail on the head. This isn't something we see every day. However, it's not rare if it's in your chair. And I know we both have seen it plenty of times in our careers, although I couldn't say I see it once a week or once a month, or sometimes I'll go a whole year without seeing it and then I'll see you know, a whole bunch of them. Uh, so it's interesting, but most of the ones that I've seen have had the papilla from their initial presentation with me. I don't know about Dr. Resnick. Yeah. So I echo that. So what's interesting is, you know, over the years, and a lot of people may have seen this, and sometimes a parent will come in and the first, they bring the kid in because they say that, oh, I think he has a little tick or he's blinking funny and they want to check it out. Um, and so again, the first thing you're going to do in a case like that, at least I do, is flip the lids because what do you think? You think foreign body sensation. And once you do that, especially if you see it bilaterally, your you know VKC radar has to you know antenna have to go up because they can appear before the symptoms of itching or hyperemia or maybe the kid has been itchy or you haven't noticed them rubbing their eyes so um, I do see this as an as an early sign absolutely interesting question here do you have any sense of uh, how long a person goes from the time they have their first symptoms until they're definitively diagnosed. Is there a pretty long gap where people are maybe just being treated for plain old allergy uh, incorrectly for a long time? Yeah. I think it varies, you know, with the patient and how vigilant their parent is too in getting them in. I have to be honest, a lot of these kids may not see us first. Some may, some may not. Some may see their pediatrician first, but I have seen a lot of them that have come in to see me first. So it kind of runs the gamut. It's opposite for me being in a larger city. Uh, because what happens first is they see the pediatrician. They're complaining maybe about itchy redness watering. So they treat them with, you know, your usual suspects of mast cell stabilizers, antihistamines. And then the pediatrician will send them to the allergist. And then the pediatric ophthalmologist. So, uh, and a lot of them will end up in tertiary. Once they make the diagnosis, they end up in tertiary care centers because it's considered a serious disease. So, that's part of why some of these patients don't filter down into our everyday uh, practices. But I'm going to make one comment now. You know, with the advent of pediatrics coming into our practice through other avenues now, through our focus on myopia management, many of us are seeing an influx of kids into our practices. So I do believe through maybe the good fortune of bringing kids in for something else, we're going to be, you know, we will be in the pipeline to be the primary care um, providers and first diagnosticians of this disease. I think we're gonna see an increased prevalence in our offices. Oh, interesting question here. Uh, could cyclosporin affect stem cells in children? Wow, that's a good one. 
In what way? I'm trying to think of what the mechanism would be. Right. It doesn't affect, so stem cells are not, so, so it's a calcium neuron inhibitor. It only affects T cells, uh, which is part of the inflammatory pathway. Stem cells are, you know, essentially progenitor cells of normal progenitor tissue. Uh, it should have no effect. As a matter of fact, one would think it would be protective versus it being any adverse effects. Uh, interesting question here, uh, Dr. Resnick mentioned, you mentioned the allergist uh, just before, and you know, you also mentioned though that you can sort of moderate some of these risk factors of making things worse, right, with avoiding dust and other triggers. Uh, is it possible that, um, and this is the question, that you would send a kid to an allergist, even though you made the diagnosis, to try to figure out what might be triggering this? Oh, absolutely. You want to look at any possible allergy to be controlled. And if they're going to benefit from um, desensitization, from allergy shots, absolutely. Um, you know, it's a form of atopy. So we have to understand that the eyes are being affected, even though that may not be the actual trigger. It may not be an ocular allergy. You know, it may not be pollen flying in their eyes. It may be something else that's invoking the inflammatory system affecting, as I said, the mucous membranes, the eyes, the nose, um, the lungs. So uh, absolutely, I send a lot of patients to allergists when I see kind of weird eye allergic changes that I can't figure out. And oh, over the years, I've come up with patients allergic to polyethylene glycol, things that are in contact lenses and solutions. And um, yeah, it's kind of an interesting thing. They do check, check for all that. Uh, question here, how long should one use cyclosporin, particularly in the difficult recurrent cases? It may need to be used for several months. So we need to keep that in mind that we should see some improvement. The Vectis trial certainly showed improvement at one month, but sometimes four months, we're still using it for six months. We just have to be very patient with it. Yeah, I, I would even I would even suggest to you that it could be it might be need to be used for years. Uh, but that's what makes it different from a steroid. You know, you want to not have steroids being used, but a cyclosporin to be on a year or two. And again, um, interestingly, um, Sue, you did an amazing job with those statistics. But what struck me was that in some of the uh, measures you discussed, there wasn't a huge difference between the BID and the QID. So remember that we're going to hit them hard with QID in the beginning, but likely we're going to be titrating it down to BID. Um, and what makes me feel happy about the fact that the BID was very effective, although not quite in some of the, uh, you know, if you look at the global endpoints, is that think about compliance. How many patients do you know that actually use drops four times a day, especially a kid? Right. So, uh, in school, and, the, and sometimes these schools refuse to administer it. It's a whole thing. So I love the fact that it's very effective at BID. Obviously, you want them to use a QID. The weekends, the parents are in more control. The summer, the warmer months when they're out of school. So that's all good. But I would suggest to you that kids are going to be on these for a couple of years. Um, you know, if you diagnose somebody at 10, um, probably they're hit puberty in my about 12 when it might start to modulate on its own. So I'm thinking anywhere from a month to two years would be adequate. Sue, so that made you made a great point about compliance. We all know our patients are notoriously non-compliant. Perhaps some of us are non-compliant ourselves with our medical treatment and care. That BID being quite effective really gives us a safety net, although the QID is really what we as the doctors need to promote. And an uh, interesting question here, uh, in the studies that you went over, uh, the vehicle actually showed to have a modest effect on its own. And I guess the question is, what is it about the vehicle that, that actually seems to help in those cases? The vehicle, as I mentioned at the beginning, is very special. So that is a good thing that the vehicle showed some good effects on the VKC, the keratitis, the symptoms, et cetera. So that's to me a positive, not a negative. So what's special about the vehicle, I've got a list of everything in the vehicle here, and I can read it off to you because I knew I was gonna get this question, so I was fully prepared. So there's an oily phase, medium chain triglyceride, Acetyl codeum chloride, which is a cationic agent. I was talking about cationic agent. Don't confuse that with BAK. 
BAK has much uh, more negative effects for sure, uh, especially um, on this type of thing where we really want to heal the keratitis rather than cause some keratitis. Uh, Tylopaxol, which is a surfactant, I mentioned that there was a really good graphic on the right hand side of one of my slides that showed the surfactant that kind of encapsulates um, cyclosporin. Then there's an aqueous base, polyoxamer 188, that's a surfactant. Glycerol, which is a fantastic wetting agent, as we all know, that's an osmotic agent. Uh, NaOH, a pH adjuster, and lastly, a little bit of water. So that is what's in it. That's all the ingredients. And it's really the cat cationic element of it that, that makes it special, that enhances its ability to stay on the surface and to be used in that 0.1% rather than the 1% or the 2%, which have also been studied. And the 0.5, we're familiar with uh, lots of cyclosporins that have 0.5 in them. And we've prescribed them for other things, and that is just not quite as effective in some of the studies as the 0.1. But the cationic emulsion really, uh, really makes this thing And uh, a question here, uh, do you agree that it would be useful to use a low osmolarity, low viscosity natural tear as prophylaxis? Low osmolarity, low. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know that I could comment on why that would be better than any other artificial tear that is preservative free. That would be my choice. Um, and again, refrigerating it would even be better. Uh, um, but I don't, well, low viscosity would be less likely to blur a child, so to that degree, yes. But I think any good eye drop that the, feels comfortable going in, that the child agrees to put in or have you put in, uh, would be advisable. All right. And question here more of, uh, about the practical issues of prescribing the cyclosporin. How does that actually work? Um, where can you get it? Is this something that you can just easily write and... You know, obviously, you guys are in, in sort of large urban areas, easy to get. Is this fairly uh, easy to get for everyone around the country? Well, it's FDA approved now, which it wasn't actually a few months ago when that patient I was referring to came in. So that was kind of a, a tricky thing. I knew that cyclosporin was going to be the treatment that she needed because she wasn't, she wasn't, um, improving at all on steroids. So I, I thought it was something like VKC, and she wasn't a contact lens wearer anyway, but the large papilla, some Horner Trantis dots, it was pretty obviously VKC. And now I know that we can get it, although that may be a better question for your local sales rep. I think they would have some real specifics on that. Yes, yeah, so I understand it is, it is definitely uh, available, obviously. Um, it is by delivery now, so the pharmacies order it in, uh, mm -hmm. and that, right now that's the way it's um, it's going. But um, yes, it is certainly available. Excellent. All right. Well, I think we are just about at, at the end of our hour. You know, if there are more questions, and I'm sure there will be more, we'll obviously have this posted at ODWire. Uh, the archive will be up. Uh, and people can sort of continue the conversation there. So Susan and Susan, thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, I think we all learned a lot. And uh, thank you everyone for coming as well. Good night. Thank you. Bye, everyone.